what would I do to rescue her? I would do anything. They have a right to have a good life. They have a right to live as a human. There are poverty issues, lack of education, and a belief system. All these things are a contributing factors for the girls to be trafficked. There will be a lot of challenges for my people. But if I believe gospel is good news, then we need to bring this good news on time. We need to find a way that how to save the children, how to keep more children in our children's home. We are helping, even though we may be in danger too. But we take this risk. Brother will sundown. Untouchable people will rise in the nation because of the gospel. It is good to be at Radiant Church this morning. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, I have had a relationship with uh, Pastor Brian, Dr. Brian Pingle. I don't know if you know, but your pastor is a doctor. Um, and Christy. Oh, he, oh he's already side-eyeing me. Well, this looks like it's going to be a one and done. Um, uh, I am thrilled to be here. Pastor Brian and Christy, they both gave me my first opportunity to speak at a youth retreat, and that was just a couple of years ago because we're very young. Um, and so to be here at Radiant at the culmination of this really two-year journey uh, with Unleash is, is an absolute honor. Now, if I'm, if I'm honest, I'm a little bit conflicted being in Iowa this morning. Uh, I grew up in Wisconsin, and um, hold it, uh, y'all can't score a touchdown to save your life offensively, but you can find a way to beat the Badgers. <laughs> credit where credit is due, congrats on the Big Ten West. Uh, um, and here's the thing that I know, today or this weekend, Brian Balaga was inducted into the Packer Hall of Fame. So this is what we have in common. For those of you who know, you know, Brian Balaga, Iowa. Uh, he's my guy. Uh, I am... Um, it's so much fun to be part of Kingdom Builders and the Miracle Offering because for me, Kingdom Builders is a cheat code. Uh, and here's what I mean by that. I grew up in the church and uh, love Jesus, love the kingdom, love the principles, but there are times when I don't feel like I'm always experiencing some of those promises, like in John 10, 10, where it says that we can have life and life to the full, or in Philippians 4, where it promises the peace that passes understanding, sometimes my life looks a little bit more stagnant or stuck where I'm looking for motivation or inspiration. And then there's this, this great commission, this kingdom builders thing that's like a cheat code if you're a gamer that is a portal. It's like this uh, 
gives you more strength or gives you more access or speeds you along in the journey. And I really believe that Kingdom Builders does that. And so wherever you are at, whether you are super spiritual or a little bit more like Dr. Pingle, anywhere in the spectrum, Kingdom Builders is an invitation for all of us, a cheat code if we dip our toes in what God is already doing. It's not just about what we can do for other people, but it's about an invitation to participate and what God's already doing. There is a, a verse at the end of that video, and it's found in Galatians, and it says, let us not grow weary in doing good, and it promises a harvest if we don't give up. And for sometimes, I love that verse. If you have ever trained for a marathon, and you're in your last half mile, and people are like, you can do it, you can do it. You're like, man, I can see the end. Absolutely, I can do it. Thank you for that encouragement. But if you're like at mile 10 and you're thinking, I've got 16 miles to go, first of all, that's a stupid sentence. You know, 16 more miles is dumb. Um, but sometimes just hearing don't give up doesn't really work. And on a more serious note, maybe as a family or individually, you get a medical diagnosis or you're going through a difficult business or financial season or something within your family. Sometimes it's hard to just hear don't, don't give up. And yet the promise and the harvest can be worth it. And really what's powerful to me is when we actually get to watch people that are living this truth out, that are in some of the toughest seasons of their life, some of the most difficult situations, some of the worst places on the planet, and we watch them not give up and we see what God is doing. That's, that's what moves me. It's one of the things that I love about the work that we get to do with our international partners at Venture. We get to actually watch people in some of the most difficult places on the planet and allow God to work through them. And John 1, 5, that says light shines in the darkness and darkness cannot, will not, will never overcome what is light. And for any of you in the room and online, if you feel like giving up, I'm just going to encourage you that darkness doesn't win, that you can persevere, that you can push through and that we are here to push through with you. I see this in the lives of our partners like Me Too. Me Too is a, a young girl that grew up in one of the countries where we serve in, and she was told by her community and society that she has three strikes against her because she's female and she lives in poverty and she's from an ethnic minority. And she was told that in a past life, because of karma, she must have done something wrong. So just kind of buckle down and do what you're told to do and maybe in the next life, you'll be better because the gods are mad at you and maybe they'll quit being mad at you. And then me too heard from one of our partners that there's a God that's not mad at her, that she is not the lowest, but she is royalty and that there is a plan where she and her family can thrive. And me too was so moved by this, she accepted Christ, but didn't just stop there. She's like, I've got to tell other people about this story and went to one of our pastor training schools and becomes a pastor at the age of 17. And as I look at this crew right here and the young folks at Manchester, all I can say is you have no idea what you are capable of doing. One of my favorite things is to speak uh, after youth convention because it's like a, it's a cheat code for a speaker. So I expect you all to be loud, right? And at Manchester, you're probably a little unruly group as well. Uh, but me too becomes a pastor. She goes back to her community, and within a month, four families become Christ followers. In the next month, 13 families become Christ followers. And the next month, another 13. So much so that in this small village, the village witch doctor who ran the village was so mad. And he said, I'm going to put you in jail. I'm going to kill you, but you are going to stop planting God's church. Me Too goes to jail three different times. Jail is a wooden box that she's crammed into that no light can get into. She has no contact with the outside world except for once a day when she's given a ball of rice with a pinch of salt. But after 30 days, Me Too is let out because the witch doctor is afraid that the jailers were going to become Christ followers. I've read a book like that before. Me Too gets out and the witch doctor says, I'm going to let you out, but I'm telling you, if you keep telling this good news or this gospel or talk about this God, I'm killing you. And she looked at him and she said, I will plant God's church or I will die. Today, she has a church that's over half of the 
whole village, and she is a powerful. So Me Too to me is like a phoenix, and I know some of you are going to get a little bit scared now because you saw the phoenix, and you see the round glasses, and you think you just walked into a Harry Potter symposium, and that's not true. The phoenix was a symbol that the early church chose to use alongside of the cross because a phoenix was this bird that was supposed to live for 500 years and would come crashing to the earth in a ball of flames, but would rise up stronger out of the ashes. The early church said that's a picture of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. It's also a picture of how we are invited to live. If you came in and you are feeling more weary, please know if you don't give up, you will reap a harvest. Rise up stronger like me too. Or like Sushila, who serves in another country where we serve. And Sushila was born to an impoverished family, and so her parents sold her as a child bride. And her husband then trafficked her. He would beat her and electrocute her. She would live for three days all by herself in a bathroom, only drinking the toilet water. But Sushila found rescue through one of our partners. And not only did she find a safe place to live and receive counseling and her own freedom, everybody would have been fine if that's all she did. But she has chosen now to free other people and she has given her life. She stands on the border of Nepal and India and she identifies vulnerable girls that are walking across seven, eight, nine, ten years old, walking across a, a national border by themselves about to be trafficked and she rescues them. Not only that, but this last year, she was given a national award because she helped take down the very trafficking ring, the largest trafficking ring in the region. And she took them down and they were in jail because she has the courage to rise up strong because she refuses to grow weary in doing good and is seeing a harvest of girls being freed and introduced to Christ. In another country we serve, it's the longest ongoing civil war on the planet. We've all seen images over the last couple of weeks of what bombs can do to communities, to individuals, to children. Can you imagine 70 years of being bombed? The result of this civil war is that ethnic minorities are literally being hunted down. Over the last 18 months, the most recent military coup created a space where there was so much of a refugee crisis uh, that they actually, the government said it made it illegal to help these marginalized communities. And yet it's in these places where we provide refugee meals. Because it's so dangerous, we had three of our partners who deliver these meals and share the gospel that were killed. Simply for sharing hope. Martyrs. That's heavy for us to figure out what to do with so venture. We had conversations with our international team and we said we're considering suspending our feeding program. And they were concerned because it's not just food, it's sharing the hope of the gospel, and these are all Christ followers. And I got an email back from one young woman who delivers our meals. And this is what she said in response to us trying to keep her safe when her people needed help. I, I uh, printed out this email. I redacted some of the stuff that would uh, put her in even more danger. But this was Cuckoo's response. I will not run away from Yangon and I will never leave my people in trouble for the safety of me and my family. No matter how difficult it is, I will always be in Yangon for my people. It's my calling from God. It's my commitment to help my people as much as I can. And it's this last line that drives so much of what I do in the morning. Shouldn't we help more when people are in need? This is, this is kingdom builders. This is the gospel. This is what drives us both physical and spiritual needs. Shouldn't we help more? This is radiant. We have come to this moment where we get to answer the question, what does it look like for us to help in some of these difficult areas? We serve at the intersection of unsafe, unreached, and under-resourced, unsafe civil wars lasting 70 years that cause a refugee crisis and an influx where people are literally living in the jungle, afraid for their lives. We serve in villages where up to 90% of the girls are being trafficked. And that's not just a bumper sticker, we're anti-trafficking. I'm gonna go PG-13 for one moment. When we're talking about girls being trafficked, girls and boys, we're talking about areas where, that are so impoverished that when they find out they're pregnant with a female, they celebrate because it's a source of income. 
Pimps literally come and pre-purchase the girls in utero, paying half of the fee, and then they come back at age six, seven, and eight. And when that happens, the girls are abused 20 and 30 times a day, after day after day. These are the unsafe places that we, that we serve in, and that intersects with unreached, which are places with less than 2% gospel witness. And, and I don't need to tell you what that means because that's part of the DNA of this house that Pastor Brian has been talking about over the last few weeks. What does it mean when less than two out of 100 people have even heard that there is a God that's not mad at them? That there is a design where they are made in the Imago Dei and they can thrive. It's those places that we want to serve, unsafe, unreached, and then under-resourced. Places where less than 1% of all Christian giving goes, which might be one of the greatest injustices that the places that need it the most, the people who need to hear the most, are receiving the least. And yet we, in this moment, as Radiant Church, as part of Kingdom Builders on this miracle offering, are saying, no, we will be strategic in those places. And here's what, here's what happens then. When you... When you work in that intersection, then what we do is we identify marginalized communities and we pick out leaders that God has already identified that have been born and raised in those areas that understand the complexity of the situation, that have a burden for people to know Jesus and understand what it means to have a path forward. And we work with them on things like feeding programs, safe houses, agribusiness, feminine hygiene and women empowerment, and planting churches. And we partner with churches like Radiant, and here's what just last year looks like. Last year, we were able to provide nine million meals to people that were dying and diseased and displaced. We were able to rescue 500 girls. So if you remember what I said, you can see the radical change of being abused 20 and 30 times a day or waking up in a safe space with good food, access to education, counseling, and sharing the hope of the gospel. Women empowerment, which I'll share some stories about later. Agribusiness. And the one thing that we know in the places we serve, this intersection of unsafe, unreached, and under-resourced is the greatest source of transformation for an individual or for an entire community is the presence of a local church, a believing community, a sacred community. And so with every project, every program, every area we serve, we connect church planting. Last year alone, our partners planted 1,270 churches in unreached places that had never heard the name of Jesus because of your generosity. This is, this is the cheat code that we, that we get to be invited into. We do not have to pick between what we do. We simply say, God, we want to be obedient to your word. This is part of what is called the Great Commission. And I don't need to do a full theological deep dive on the Great Commission. If you haven't had a chance to be here in the room at Manchester Online over the last couple of weeks, I would encourage you to go back as Pastor Brian has unpacked what it means to respond to the Great Commission. This, So there are two greats, right? There is the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. That's, what's, that's what is Christ's followers. The Great Commandment is love God and love others. Now, for me, I'm an Enneagram too. I can love others all day long. I will hug every single one of you. It might get awkward, but I'm, I'm all about loving. Then we have this great commission, this thing of walking it out, living it out that sometimes can be more difficult. And yet in this moment, we are invited to be a part of an, a powerful move of God. You know, just this last year in Nepal, where most of those churches were planted, we had the opportunity to be a part of a mass baptism. Over a thousand people were baptized in one moment. It was a historic moment for that country. Pastors in those areas were crying. They had never heard of anything. And then afterwards, they did prayer gatherings. Over 6,000 people showed up, and they called it prayer as protest, that they were going to uh, unashamedly move God's kingdom forward in one of the most closed countries in the world. As they respond to the Great Commission at the exact same time, we are invited. Because the Great Commission is not just an invitation to help other people. It's an invitation to be a part of what God is already doing that will then begin to transform who we are. That cheat code that gives us access to peace that passes understanding and life to the full. And so 
In Matthew 28, 18 and 19, the Great Commission says, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them everything that I have taught you, and I will be with you until the end of the age. There's one word that that grabs me every time I read it, and it's simply the word go. It quite possibly is the least theological of all of the words. But I'm a simple guy. I'm not a doctor. In the Greek, go is porthetes, used about 150 times in the Second Testament. And it simply means to move forward. It means to take a step towards. It means to have a destination and to take a step towards that. And this is the invitation for all of us on any given moment. But as we gather together this morning, it's our invitation to be a part of what Kingdom Builders is doing. What does it look like for us to go? And we've talked a lot over the last couple of weeks about ways people are already going throughout the world. And now the invitation is for us to consider what it means for us to go. And so I'm just going to share three ways that we're all invited to go, every single one. And the first one is that we can go in our community. You see, I grew up in a tradition where we didn't have something cool like Kingdom Builders. We just had missions convention. Do you all know missions convention? All of a sudden, you'd roll in on a Sunday, and there'd be flags from all the nations around, and you'd be forced to eat food that didn't really sit well in your stomach. And and your decision was, how much money were you going to give, and if you were going to be a missionary? And I will tell you, there's nothing wrong with any of that. But the start of the Great Commission has less to do with distance, and it has to do with destination. It has less to do with the proximity and how far away we're going to go, and more of our posture. Do we see people who are disconnected from God right in front of us? And maybe, maybe you're like me and you have a little bit of a conflicted relationship because I, I grew up and I would go to classes where they would teach me how to go to somebody's house, knock on the door and say, are you going to heaven or hell? And if they thought they were going to hell, I would talk them into going to heaven. And, and there is actually nothing wrong with people who are called to just cold turkey talk to people. But, but what about somebody like me who's not really that interested in getting into an argument about somebody's belief or trying to tell them to behave better? And then I heard a story. It was actually about a pastor in Waterloo. I believe he referred to it as the Dirty Lou. Don't judge me. I live in North Minneapolis, so I probably would like to live in the Dirty Lou. Uh, but this pastor, this pastor's story, he grew up in a, in a community that was difficult and in a home that was difficult. And because of those difficulties, he made some difficult choices and was exposed to things that landed him in jail early in life. And coming out of jail and having done some things he's not proud of, he one night said, God, I'm tired of all of this. I don't even know who you are, God, or which religion you are, but if you are there, would you just give me a sign? And having no answer, he went to bed. And then the next morning, there was a knock on the door, and he opens the door, and it's a pastor. And Q, as he goes by, Pastor Q said, are you a pastor? He said, yes. He goes, I guess I'm going to be a Christian. And now, now he runs an incredible church in Waterloo. And in the point when I heard this story, all of my hangups about knocking on doors or sharing my faith or belief and all that went out the window. And I'm like, if people are disconnected from God and they're saying, would you just reveal yourself? I want to be available. I just want to be available in those moments. I think most of us, if you have experienced the peace that God offers, the shalom, we want to be ready when someone is asking. We learn a ton from the global church. Uh, One of the reasons why last year we planted uh, 1,200 churches, our partners, and this year we are on pace. Our partners will plant over 4,000 in 2023. Uh, One of the reasons is because this multiplicative Uh, uh, more like a recipe. And it's just that everybody does five things. They pray and read the Bible. They hang out. They say the lost. I'm going to actually help them rebrand to the disconnected because I loved the explanation. They hang out with the poor and the oppressed. They meet collaboratively or corporately. And they just instantly are looking for people to bring along with them. Not when they've become 
a pastor or when they're on stage or when they're like a rock star, you know, parking lot person. But just as soon as they can, they're bringing people along. And one of the things that they say is, here's the deal. We pray our guts out and the Holy Spirit brings us people. And so we've been trying to practice that. We've been trying to practice just praying for people that we feel are disconnected from God. And one of our team members had been praying for his neighbor for three weeks. And his neighbor knocks on the door after three weeks and he says, hey, my kids are acting a fool and your kids are not. They seem pretty well adjusted. Can you tell me what's going on? What can we do? And uh, he's like, oh, well, we are, we are connected to a faith community and our kids go to youth group. And, and he's like, can we come to church? That easy. I guarantee three weeks and people are knocking on your door and they're going to come to Radiant. It's a growth strategy. So they come to church and um, sit next to him. And after the church service is over, they kind of have that requisite conversation. If you've ever nervously brought your friend to church and then you want to see what they feel about it. And so he asks, he's like, hey, how did you like church? And his friend's like, man, that was some good, well, a word that we can't say no matter how cool this church gets, we're not going to put that word on the website. Okay. But to those people who use that word, it's a ringing endorsement. And he asked if he could come back. And they came back the second week and the third week happened to be Easter. And at the end of the service, as happens at Radiant often, the pastor said, if you feel disconnected from God and would like to start a relationship, raise your hand. And my buddy who breaks rules, didn't close his eyes, didn't bow his head. He looks down the row and the man and his wife and his kids all raise their hand. As we head into the holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas, here's what I know is that the holidays don't make everybody feel nice. They just magnify whatever you're feeling. So lonely people feel lonelier. Addicted people feel more addicted. Happy people feel happier, and you'll see them. <laughs> what if we just started praying? What if our step into kingdom builders is your family members, is the people that you care about, those who maybe God has put on your heart that are feeling disconnected, young people coming back from convention. It's great if you do this at the altar, but God doesn't want to stop there. He wants to put names of people who are at night crying because they feel so alone. And you have the opportunity to connect a disconnected person to a wholly connected God and kingdom through this invitation. So we can go in our community, and that's a great place to start. You do this so well as a church. You do this through uh, uh, the different things in Kingdom Builders, like Youth for Christ and His Hands, different crisis pregnancy. You guys do it beautifully. But the invitation is, what about you? What if somebody's praying and just hoping that somebody would be available to say, there's a God who's not mad at you, and there's a design where you can thrive. So we can go through the community and we can also, we can go through Kingdom Builders. And I've said it many times, it's this cheat code, it's this invitation to be a part of what God's doing. I love the Great Commission is, is this invitation, a commissioning is like a commissioning to be a part of painting a beautiful piece of art or a commissioning to build a beautiful building. Over the last two years, you've seen that this space has been commissioned and transformed. A commissioning, if you've served in the armed forces, a commissioning from the nation to, to be an ambassador of everything that we believe in. And this is the Great Commission, is an invitation for us to be a part of something beautiful in Kingdom Builders. In Kingdom Builders, and I've I've made a few jokes about Pastor Brian, not so much Christy, because, well, I want to stay on her good side. Um, but these are not just leaders that are smart and strategic and educated, um, but these are leaders that pray and are discerning and caring and loving. And so when we talk about kingdom builders, I recognize I'm just one person, one organization as part of incredible group of organizations that have been prayed over that match the DNA of this house way before any of us were here early on at the history of this legacy church, what it means to come alongside of the poor and the oppressed and those who have not heard that God loves them. And so for organizations like Project 42 and Convoy of Hope, for things like One Child, Man, for us to be able to step in and to match the tenacity of our partners, people like Shashila and Cuckoo that says, shouldn't we help more when people are in need? I'm telling you, people are in need and we have an opportunity. So we can go 
through kingdom builders, we can go through our community and we can also go through what I'm just going to call traditional missions or frontier missions. And that means in this space, some of you will be called to go physically, maybe to Honduras this year or other missions trips that are available. Or maybe it's something else, and I'm going to look at this group again one more time, because Venture started when a student heard a missionary talking, and they decided they were going to respond to that need. And what started from a student responding to that need has turned into more than $60 million in missions uh, work around the world. And so pay attention to these moments. You have no idea what your yes might mean. And to those of you who are a little bit older, a little bit more follically challenged, we are not done yet. We get to continue to support them to give, but then also to hear the God of the universe inviting us to be a part of this movement that's happening through Radiant. And when we do these things, we get to be a part of some of the most incredible Stories of transformation, not just for individuals, but whole communities, like my friend Hannah. Watch this. My parents and village people work in the gravel pit. During rainy season, work is not possible, since the shores are flooded. Many people go hungry from the little they earn from selling sand. Therefore, people are compelled to sell their bodies. In Nepal, there is a caste system. Brahman is the highest caste. And Badi are a part of the Dalit, which is the lowest, the untouchable caste. When I was small, our friend and her husband lived near our house, and they would often come to visit. The husband told my sister that he wanted to take her to visit our mother's birthplace in Ramgat. Instead, he took her in a tractor, where he drugged her to make her unconscious. He sold her for $30. I started losing consciousness from the shock of losing my sister. So my father took me to the hospital in Nepal Gunj. When the doctor checked the x-ray, he read the report that I was Badi. He then tried to rape me. Later, I told my father that my doctor tried to rape me. My father said, if we say something to anyone, they will not treat us. To whom shall we complain? When I met Hannah, her ace was a crucial ace to be sold out in Delhi. And she has also had great fear that somebody will destroy her life. So it took a long time for me to establish relationship. And then I began to build relationship with Hannah, her father. I began to share my heart to them that in order to protect them, we would start hostel or home in Kathmandu. And, uh, give them education and when I hear this they they got excited when I went to the hostel the behavior of the people there changed me after going there I learned what real love looks like and the thing that changed me most has been getting to know Jesus in seven years of time out of 700 people, 400 people have come to know the Lord. And today, by the power of the gospel, the village is changing. And the former trafficker who sold Hannah's sister is the pastor of that church. 
I'm very thankful to the Lord for venture because partnership is helping us to fulfill our daily needs in the hostel, in the schools, everywhere. And together we are going to stop human trafficking in Badi people. There's so much that you could unpack in that video. So many things that we don't have time for. Some of you hear the story of the pastor and you're like, redemption, and others of you are like, where's the justice? And if you have questions about that, you can come and talk to me. Um, but the power of the gospel is at work in that story. 180 of her family members becoming Christ followers that Hannah just didn't receive rescue, but is now part of transforming her community. Actually, if, uh, if I'm honest, that video is about six years old. That whole village is almost all Christian now. And what Hannah has been doing since then, Hannah came over to the U.S. And, and shared some of her story because she's the first in so many ways, the first to graduate from high school or college, the first to fly over to the U.S., the first to share in a group like this. And, and people were so moved by her story that she had two books written about her. She was offered two full-ride scholarships to university. She was offered U.S. citizenship, and, and she had landed uh, down in Florida where she was living in a multi-million dollar home with somebody that just opened up their family to her and everything was going great. And then a global pandemic hit and she felt like God was pulling her away from all of that to go back to who she calls her sisters, every girl in her people group that is vulnerable. And what it looks like for the courage to leave all of it, to literally leave a mansion and to go back where the need is so great. I think of Cuckoo that says, shouldn't we help more when people are in need? And so she leaves the mansion and she rents a 400 and square foot apartment, which is not very much. And, and then you find out that she allowed 10 other girls to live with her in that 400 square foot apartment just because she wanted to do everything she could to help people, especially the most vulnerable. And, and she started looking around and saying, where are the needs? And she started her own organization, the first ever female-led body organization called Her Himalayan Entrepreneurial Resources, which is hard to say. Um, but And it focused on feminine hygiene, women empowerment, and rescuing. And just last week, I was with Hannah as she was over here, and I said, Hannah, I go to churches all the time, and, and what they ask is, what does feminine hygiene have to do with rescuing girls and sharing the gospel? Oh, brother, she says. This is how she always, oh, brother Paul, let me tell you. She said, we go into these villages, and she has uh, 60 women that sometimes walk three to five hours through villages to share with women how their bodies are beautifully made. And she said, but we don't just stop there. We share the gospel and we encourage moms to tell their girls they don't have to be trafficked. And we identify girls who are vulnerable and we rescue them. And she said, I've recently gotten a letter from a country that I can't tell you where, but has given us full access to bring our feminine hygiene program into this country that to our knowledge nobody has been able to get in and she's already started a church there and she said she went to another country and she wanted a heart to take girls out of these brothels and then she met two of her cousins that were born in this brothel had lived there their whole life and she shared the hope of the gospel and they became Christ followers and when she goes back she said, January 10, we are launching not only feminine hygiene, but the first church inside of this brothel. She said, if I cannot take all the girls out, I will bring the church in. And then she got another letter from a government that, where she works in Nepal and said, would you go share feminine hygiene in the prison? And she said, Paul, I went to 
share feminine hygiene in the prison, but I saw the need and I couldn't help but share my story and the gospel. And 25 of these women became Christ followers and there's a church in that prison. So this is what it means when we talk about an invitation into kingdom builders, into the great commission, we get to be a part of these incredible things. How does feminine hygiene, by the way, she's trained 45,000 women in feminine hygiene. The last big group that she went to, she went in and they said there was gonna be 300 girls and she said, I don't have 300 kids. But when she got there, they're like, good news, not 300, 500. Um, so there were 500 girls, she only had less than 300 kids and she said, we'll pray and we'll pass them out. Maybe you've heard a story like this. By the end of it, literally all 500 plus had a kit in their hand, physically impossible physically impossible that it happened. They had 42 left over that went to a prison. Yeah, that went to a pregnancy crisis center. The gospel, what God is doing, God is already unleashing. There are movements happening. There are courageous people. And this is our moment to match that tenacity. This is our moment to match the tenacity of people like Hannah or people like Sushila or Cuckoo. It's our opportunity to step in and embrace this cheat code, even if we're just tipping our toes in the water. I want to say thank you for your generosity and for the DNA of this house, that it would prioritize people around the world to hear the good news. I'm going to invite you, if you want, to bow your head and close your eyes, or you can look at me because I'm not going to bow my head, but I am going to pray a prayer blessing over you. And it's part the priestly blessing from Leviticus, but David does something crazy in Psalm 64. He kind of does this mishmash of the priestly blessing and the great commission. And he said, may the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you so that the nations may know that he is God. I pray over your families. I pray over the house. I pray over the leadership for his kingdom come and his will to be done. Amen.